Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Porto. Welcome to the City of Makers. My name is Joana Lacerda, and I will be your host for this roundtable. Today, we are here to discuss from a very deep and philosophical perspective the challenges of, of, and opportunities that artificial intelligence is bringing to social impact and ethics. And for that, I have the honor to have with me three super special persons from very diverse uh, fields to discuss and that are applying and researching AI um, towards their works. Uh, starting with the ladies, uh, Joanna here uh, is an award-winning fashion tech and costume designer. Her area of expertise are wearables and the merge of fashion and technology. Joanna graduated from the London College of Fashion with an MA degree in strategic fashion management and a bachelor in fashion design technology. Her clients include Sony Music, Universal Music and BBC. And Joanna worked with artists such as Drake, Rita Ora and Sakankanesi. Joanna has also been a guest speaker at various tech and fashion conferences and winner at the International Women in Tech Awards in the category of fashion tech and the winner of the Innovation World Cup 2018. Moving to Fernanda. Fernanda Torre is a, a visiting teacher at the Stockholm School of Economics, where she lectures in innovation and entrepreneurship in the MBA program. She is also the CEO um, and founding partner of Next Agents, a consulting boutique focusing on innovation management. Research-wise, Fernanda is part of the Vinova project for boards.ai, aiming to support corporate boards governing AI towards innovation and sustainability. She is also a founding member of the Speculative Futures Institute to Com. Uh, and teaches future thinking and design thinking at the Stockholm uh, School of Entrepreneurship. And Francisco Marcos Teixeira, which is a neuroscientist and neurotechnologist applying technologies to health and self-knowledge to understand how new technologies may change our brain and our minds will adapt themselves to this new kind of digital existence. He is the clinical director of the Neurofeedback Department of the Neuroscience uh, Institute Neurobius and co-founder of Mew Arts, a company specializing in concept design and prototyping of creative technology and innovation in neurotechnology. For the last years, Francisco has been working with techie developers, geeky artists, researchers and hackers to link the brain to the Internet of Things in order to enter in a transhumanist age and promote brain-computer interactions as well as brain-to-brain -brain communication. In 2019, Francisco founded the Translate Transmedia and Transformational Technology Festival, which first edition happened in Lisbon last year. Briefly introducing myself, I have been dedicating my last years in the social impact uh, topics, which led me to be uh, nominated as one of the 30 under 30 Forbes in the law and, and, and policy category. And currently, I am also advising the European Commission towards the, the, the implementation of the AI strategy and working with the fundamental and the powerhouse in the future of fashion. Moving from the intro to our topic today. So artificial intelligence is more and more in our reality and is everywhere from our smartphones to self-driving cars. This topic has been discussed from designers to politicians and from that lots of questions have been arising to where it's going to, to take us in the future and how our lives are and will be impacted by this tool. Is AI a friend or an enemy? To start, I would like to ask a common question to all of you. So how is and will AI change fashion, Joana, our brains, Francisco, and governments, Fernanda? So Joana, you want to start? Hi, hi everyone. Um, 
So AI is already changing fashion. I mean, the only way to create something new in fashion without referencing the past is to implement technology or to collaborate with different industry. Um, there are several points I would like to touch. Um, AI is influencing fashion in terms of operational, creative and functional, um, especially now during the coronavirus and um, lack of testing, the information from the body is more uh, relevant than ever. So body is such a great interface to start with, and that is not really um, widely used yet. Um, that's the first point I would like to um, add. Um, on the other hand, I don't think AI will ever replace human, the craft, human hand and human brain in terms of creativity. So I think uh, the only way to move forward is very healthy, sustainable collaboration between human and an AI. Thank you, Zuena. So, Francisco, do you want to explore how uh, and if uh, AI is uh, changing our brains or if it will? Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I believe AI is changing the way we think and the way the brain works. Um, in my specific field, we work with diagnosis and treatment of uh, neuropsychiatric diseases. And AI is helping a lot on the diagnosis because we can see things that normally we, it's impossible for us to see with AI uh, treating data because we are able to see new patterns that a common psychologist or psychiatrist without the help of AI cannot see. Work. So in my opinion, AI is very helpful and is changing mainly the way we face the problems and in my case, the brain problems and the diseases. Um, yeah, and as Joanna said, um, and as you said in the beginning, AI, I believe that is our friend and we can uh, evolve a lot with, uh, with that tool. Thank you, Francisco. Fernanda, would you like to give us your point of view from the governance and also like the social impact of it? Hello, Joana. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I think that the question is AI friend or foe is, is, is a quite good starting point. And to be honest, I think it depends who you ask. If you ask the guy that was arrested, I, I think it was now in June, uh, it was the first time that the person got arrested. This happened in the US due to uh, AI mistake. So it turned out that uh, yeah, the facial recognition software just identified the wrong person. Um, and, and you know, when the police went there to arrest uh, this person, I think Williams was his name. Oh, OK, it's not you. Oops. So, you know, if, if, you, if you ask him, probably he's not super happy about the experience. But of course, uh, as Francisco brought up and very well, you can really use AI for a lot of uh, goods and, and, and very uh, impactful uh, activities. Um, you know, from uh, diagnostics like uh, Francisco was uh, um, pointing out to, um, you know, impact in, in it real impact in people's lives, like uh, uh, forecasting floods um detecting uh, diseases uh, in, in in plants uh, in in uh, uh, in animals predicting wildfires um for us that that uh, live in portugal or for everyone out there in california etc for and a lot of places that have been hit by wild wildfires i mean you know it would be great to have a bit of warning so i mean it's really like any technology is agnostic so it, it really depends what you do with it and i think that's why it's so interesting to see what's the role of leadership in this context because to a great extent what ai does really depends on what leaders want to do with it so you know you go to the people that have the decision power and you ask them okay now that we can do anything what will we do 
And I think that's pretty much the moment in history that we're in. There's so much potential for good and bad that, that it's actually interesting to, to think about, I think, different perspectives. On one hand, you have to think about education for AI. How much do we actually need to speak this language? Um, and, and, you know, I think we're uh, um, in, a, in a real balance here. Uh, a, a couple of years back when I was in Web Summit, uh, there was the presentation from uh, Christopher Wiley that was the um, whistleblower from Cambridge Analytica. And he was saying, you know, uh, I, I talked to a lot of uh, famous people and a lot of politicians. And uh, he was telling the experience that he was talking with a congressman that told him, oh, you know, I'm too old to understand this technology. My assistant does, you know, all the Facebook and Twitter and stuff. So, uh, you know, sorry if I, if, I, if I can't really discuss this. And apparently his answer was something like, okay, imagine if I would tell you, a congressman, you know, um, that you are doing your job and you don't know anything about uh, the civil rights movement or you don't know anything about sustainability. Or, so it's a super important topic and the education about our leaders in order to understand enough to at least be able to, to, to have an informed discussion about this. So this is a bit on one side of the spectrum. On another side of the spectrum, um, Catherine Mironok, she's from uh, Singularity University, a good friend of mine, and she always uses this example that um, for leaders to govern AI, they don't need to know AI, as in you can drive a car, you can uh, um, know, know what kind of maintenance you should do to a car, and you don't need to be a mechanical engineer, right? You don't need to know the nitty gritty of the technology in order to be able to know that you have to follow certain rules with this technology that is a car. So I think that somewhere in between that spectrum, the kind of education and how we're building uh, our leadership to, to deal with AI is very important. Again, having in mind the, the huge impact that we can have uh, with AI for good and, and bad. Thank you, Fernanda. Um, um, when are you I, would like to, I would like to add something to what you said. Um, um, during my residency at Electro Couture, uh, run, run by Lisa Lang in Berlin, um, I was part of the group Fashion Tech exhibition, and there was, for example, uh, people growing uh, sustainable leather out of um, different fruits. Um, and what happened was, when they tried to register, uh, there was no laws that would protect them or forbid them of doing certain things. Um, so sometimes the technology, I mean sometimes, I think we are experiencing it um, all the time and it's going to go faster. The technology is developing so quickly that the law doesn't really follow fast enough because of bureaucracy. Uh, to even implement the laws we should follow. So, um, especially when it comes to data, the, the body data. Um, I work with Francesco on a project um, uh, called Vision Quest. Um, the team was enlightenment engineering and uh, consciousness hacking. So, um, we added brain sensor um, in a cap that was measuring brain, brain activity. And the whole goal of the project was to um, to get data and uh, propose, uh, first of all, diagnose uh, what, what are the abnormalities of the brain and then propose treatment. Now, who has the data? I mean, it's your data, but where is it stored? What's the law protecting this data? Do you have a right to sell this data if you want? Can you even have a right to say, yes, I want to um, make this data available or do you have ownership? So I think this is a very important uh, um, moment to discuss since AI is taking over so many parts of different industries. Um, and again, um, with coronavirus, I think e-health and well-being will be the next top trend in terms of wearables. Um, but again, in order to even go mass market with any kind of um, proposal, we need laws protecting data of these people who would participate. So that's something I wanted to add from my perspective. 
and I have, I want to uh, talk about three points um, to start. I want to talk about what Fernanda said about the lawmakers. They don't need to know about AI to know uh, what we can do or not with uh, with this tool. Um, I slightly disagree because I believe that the more you know about um, a technology, you can go deeper. And I have an example uh, that is the programmer bias. Uh, sometimes it happens that AI is created by humans and that those humans are programmers. And for instance, when you are uh, defining a threshold of a decision making in a diagnosis, you have to define that threshold. And as humans, we define it with more 5% or less 5% of accuracy. And that can accumulate a bias. Uh, so we have to be very careful with that because in the end, in the final decision making, that is the AI that is going to do. Uh, it was the first programmer that made a small bias that can induce uh, diagnosis pro problems, uh, law problems. Uh, and so on. Uh, the other point I think that is very important that Joanna said uh, is the ownership of the data. Of course, AI and with AI, but regarding mainly our, our work that we use biometric data, that in my opinion is very sensitive data because we are dealing with thoughts of the people, uh, we have to be very, very careful. Um, and the third one is about AI and creativity, because I can give an example. On this translate, I invited an artist called Rania, and she was creating a, a piece, a song with an AI. So she was singing, and then an AI bot was singing with her. And then comes uh, ownership, like creativity, creativity, ownership, questions about, is that piece all created by Rania? or is created by Rania and the programmer that created the AI, or may, may the AI has, have a legal identity so they can share the creative, the creative ownership of the art piece that was created. So that for me is a very interesting question because I believe that in the future AI will start having a certain degree of um, individual uh, legal status that will allow us to, or them, the AI, to, to be accountable for their decisions or to be, to, to be the owner of a, of a piece that was created. So I think these three points are, are very important to, to, to acknowledge if you want to start debating about AI. Well, yeah, um, I, I wanted, I'm sorry. Sorry, I just wanted uh, to add one point. This is relevant to what you said, Fernanda, as well. Um, I'm sure you all remember uh, Mark Zuckerberg in his American Senate when they were questioning him and they didn't know what they're talking about. It was, um, I mean, not everyone, but many people questioning him didn't know how Facebook works and how data ownership works. I think it's very important to to have that understanding before you're able to make a law um, and also uh, creating these laws, you can um, really uh, limit the potential of AI trying to protect people from it. As example, uh, me and Francesco did um, the Neurotech Cup. Um, I, had a, um, I had a talk and presentation in the Ministry of Technology in Warsaw about it. And after the talk, uh, I had the lady from Ministry of Defense inviting me for the meeting. And first question was, can you um, activate a bomb with uh, brain activity? So there is, you know, um, there, there they can be, I think it depends in which hands it is. Because on the other hand, what Francesco does with it is helping people heal from illnesses that traditional medicine is not able to heal. On the other hand, you can it can be used by Ministry of Defense. So I think it's really important for for lawmakers to understand the full spectrum of potential uh, before decisions are made. Yeah, absolutely. I think we we all agree with that. 
uh, I think what's interesting is to also think about how do we understand understand if I'm if trying to, to make what I'm thinking more clearly to what devil to what level of depthness does one need to go in order to have an understanding over the technology I mean of course that the more you know the more you know that you don't know the more knowledge you have the more you understand what you don't understand but um, let me bring up a, a, a very concrete, a concrete example from research. So uh, Stephanie Werner, uh, she's, she's a, a, a researcher from MIT, um, a, a good friend also, and she has also been collaborating with us in our research uh, for Boards AI. And um, what her research found, found out is that for a corporate board to really have an impact when it comes to digitalization and AI, to really have an impact in the performance of the firm, you need to have at least uh, three tech-savvy board members. So basically what the research shows is that you need to have three persons that can discuss technology to you know, a fair level uh, that, that they, they identified in this research as tech-savvy in order to be able to really drive change to the point of creating impact. Uh, I think that this is actually quite interesting and, and that they, they come up with three as the magic number. I think that this is interesting from a um, critical mass perspective. So it means that it's very difficult to drive change if you're just one person. And then in that, in that case, you can be, you know, data scientist, you can be Francisco, you can be, you know, real expert in this. But if you're alone, maybe it, you know it's just too hard to drive change. So you do need a certain context, and it doesn't need to be that all these people are are super uh, uh, experts when it comes to AI, but enough in in order to be able to drive change. Now this brings another topic that I think is actually quite interesting, and I wrote here a, a little post-it that that says "Power to the Geeks." And what I mean by this is that um, I am personally uh, worried about power being um, uh, separated from the traditional uh, 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 power institutions. Because those we have somewhat uh, a governance system around them that has been, you know, for the good and the bad. Um, right or wrong, but there's some kind of uh, uh, scrutiny. Uh, you know, you can you can criticize the, the current political systems, but um, there are there are some ways of of of, of keeping check on them. And I think it's actually really interesting the point that Francisco brought brought, brought up about the biases and. You know, you can even say, okay, one thing is is a bias, something that you're not even conscious that you're doing, but you, as 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 a coder, you can have the power of even consciously make a, a program, design something that is going to have a huge impact, and you will never be scrutinized over it. So uh, this 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 uh, this logging. Of, of power in, and impact from from traditional leadership and traditional accountability systems, um, I find that quite troubling. Yeah. And the question is, how are people going to check that? How are going like these programmers be accountable for their? mistakes or their changes or biases that some maybe the governance is is making them doing that as it happened with uh cambridge analytics uh that's the thing and for that and for people that understand about coding you have levels and different languages and you can add these biases in each level low level high level so it, it's kind of we we should have a kind of a police in each level controlling the these biases that can be added on each level so it's, it's going to be a very a big challenge because uh there's two different worlds talking the program the coding world and then the controlling account accountability world to control these 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 programmers um 
and what what people might do or they're already doing they are putting ai controlling the ai uh coders so this is a, a very complicated um way of of solving this these topics let me just jump in i'm talking way too much but so stop me joanna um i think that just just you know brainstorming here um I think that there is something in empowering the programmers themselves, in creating a code of conduct, in creating the kind of uh, um, code that different professions have uh, that will kind of um, at least be a reference, something that people can refer to and have a relation uh, towards something that can even be an inspiration. Let me give you an example. A couple of years back, when I was uh, working in the Stockholm Resilience Center, together with uh, Victor Galas uh, and a super cool of uh, uh, um, a very interdisciplinary uh, team of, of uh, super cool people that we gathered at the time, um, and Frederick Morberry, also from the Stockholm Resilience Center. Uh, we published the biosphere codes. So we 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 had a a, a long process of development and then a, a workshop that culminated and and you know you guys just Google it. Um, and it was basically a manifesto, several several points, some kind of a general guideline for all the uh, everyone out there that is working with algorithmic algorithmic development you know if i want to have an impact when it comes to the biosphere to sustainability towards the biosphere what can i do through my through my work so i think you know just just a couple of examples but um definitely a lot more work needs to be put into this i, I was it's just a point i was thinking about Probably the solution will be blockchain because with smart contracts and when the when only when the nodes different nodes and I'm, get, I'm getting a little bit technical when the different nodes and all the community the community uh, validates the transaction or the code that is being created is when we can go for the next step. So I really believe that blockchain could be one of the solutions for AI control, uh, not control accountability. Yeah, to uh, AI accountability. Yeah. So going a little bit back in the topic, uh, and this question is for, for Joanna, but for all of you, of course. Um, once and since today, like AI is owning uh, patents and these, these kind of IP things, um, what's the role of AI and how AI is creating new opportunities in the creative process of a designer? And not only for you, Joanna, but also for uh, Fernanda, for, for the design thinking process also. Like, what's the role and what's, what are the opportunities and, of course, the challenges that arise from this? I mean, uh, inc including AI in a creative process is like getting totally new language and medium you can play with. Um, not only creatively, but also, as I mentioned, in terms of operations and uh, function. Um, there is brands that appear uh, at the moment that offer, for example, contactless fashion. It's purely digital. Um, one of the examples is uh, Tribute. It's purely digital fashion clothes. They never exist in the real world. Um, you buy them and you apply them to your photo or video. Um, there is a big aspect of sustainability when it comes to that because you don't use uh, water, you don't use material, you don't use electricity and so on. Um, it doesn't really have any other function than identity or creating beautiful image. Um, however, I believe this is where the future is going. Come looking at the climate change and all the waste, uh, just in UK, there is 3.6 billion unworn clothes bought every year. The number is huge. So um, I think we are becoming more conscious of how we're buying and uh, where the clothes are coming from. Um, the, the race of sustainable uh, smart materials is on the horizon. Um, at the moment, one of the, actually it's a Portuguese brand, Pangaya, 
um, they are offering um, hoodies that cost around 100 pounds. Um, hoodie in UK you can buy for 30, 25 pounds. Um, they sold out. Uh, the only difference is that they're using natural uh, fibers and uh, fully organic cotton uh, sourced sustainably. So again, um, I think that will be the new trend. Um, in terms of blockchain, um, blockchain could help to uh, to follow the commitment of the companies to sustainable uh, production or help to uh, reduce the, um, the fakes that are being sold, imitations and so on. So um, there is really, really broad, um, uh, that's really broad topic that is very hard to cover in short time uh, because possibilities are endless. Um, Another example in terms of the function, H&M Germany Lab just launched a um, wearable love jacket um, that uh, the aim is to help um, couples or loved ones during um, self-distancing. Uh, the jacket is, um, um, has um, touch sensors. So uh, when the one person on the other side of the world has an app, for example, and is touching the certain points on the app, the person wearing, can, wearing the jacket can, can sense it. Um, another layer, AR, uh, Rihanna's brand Fenty. Um, one of the things that you really need to try before you buy is sunglasses. Uh, so Fenty is offering um, AR uh, fitting room for sunglasses, for example. Uh, this is also a way to be sustainable because it will, it will reduce the, the shipment, the cost, uh, you know, the returns, the whole human resources involved and so on. Um, but as I said, I, um, I think, I mean, I'm sure um, AI will never replace the human craft. Someone who was teaching for 40 years and can do it perfectly or uh, someone who is cutting uh, very unusual shapes of garments. So I think in, in my prediction, we will replace some um, very repetitive human functions with AI just to speed up the process, make it more sustainable. Um, however, as humanity, I believe in the next coming years, we will go into more organic way of what we, what, how things that we were are produced and so on. Um, plus body as an interface, this is such a great um, opportunity to, to get all the data, but then we need laws in place. You know, there are so many things that are on, on the horizon to, um, to implement before we can really go um, mass market with it. Um, the e-health, the, the whole information from the body, um, fabrics that can protect us from viruses or from UV, uh, the possibilities are endless. So um, I think in the next 20 years we will see real boom. Um, when I was uh, starting in the fashion tech field, there was maybe 15 people around the world doing it. Now I can see uh, mass market brands and uh, high-end brands like Louis Vuitton, Chanel, uh, Nike Lab implementing AI solutions that for me maybe they're old because I, I was playing with it five years ago, but means market is ready for it. Fernanda, do you want to add a bit here uh, about creativity and AI? So what are the, the, the challenges and opportunities that AI is bringing to the creative thinking? Oh my God, I have so much to say. <laughs> and I love the examples that you brought up, Joanna. Uh, I think really, really interesting from, from many different fields. Um, I mean, this, this is what I do for a living, right? Uh, work with innovation. So, um, I, 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 again, stop me if I, if I speak too much, but so, so here's the thing. Um, you really have the world kind of, I would say, and now I'm being a bit exaggerated, but kind of divided into the tech optimists and the tech pessimists. And it does feel like, uh, I mean, I, 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 I work a lot within the entrepreneurial world and it does feel that 
there is a lot of excitement around AI and the potential, uh, the potential around AI and all the innovations and, and, and so much that you can do. But then there's another part of me coming from the design side and I come from a very traditional kind of design background from uh, graphic design in Porto, very traditional school, experience design in Konstfak, uh, here in Stockholm, that is kind of a traditional school when it comes to arts and crafts. And, 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 and I would say that from the design side, there's a lot of skepticism when it comes to technology, exactly because of some of the points that Joanna brought up, you know, until what extent can this replace or not humans, but also the quality, the aesthetical quality of, of the innovations that you're bringing, until what extent can AI have, have this kind of aesthetical quality. The thing is that um, it, it does feel like two worlds that are a bit clashing in a way, because what I see coming from this very optimistic side of the world from from entrepreneurs and, and startups and trying to drive change is really uh, uh, around uh, uh, um, uh, pushing forward technology uh, in a way that uh, many times is is technology for the technology's sake is doing something just because it's cool it's just because you can do it okay why shouldn't you um, and then, and then this other kind of more careful side, maybe that 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 is actually many times the side that is very focused on methodologies like design thinking that are very human centric. So then, it's not the technology for the technology's sake, but rather really focusing on the problems, uh, on the real needs of the users. Um, sometimes users don't even need to be human. You know, what's the, what are the problems from the biosphere? Kind of the problems from the animals. Kind of what, what kind of challenges we have nowadays, especially when it comes to um, all, all all the challenges that are really the first time that we are encountering them as human species, as climate change, for example. And then how can we solve this? And okay, maybe maybe uh, technology is part of the solution, but how can we do this in a, in a human centric way? And I think that kind of bridging these two worlds is is such a challenge. I myself, I have to say that that I'm very inclined towards rather try to focus more and more on the problem and on the user and what we're trying to design for or innovate for. Because what I see time and time again, coaching startups, uh, meeting entrepreneurs out there, uh, is that you have fabulous ideas that no one cares about and I'm, I'm just intrigued by the amazing power if you could actually get all these people aligned towards uh, doing something that would drive impact then it's not just about doing an app another travel app for the app sake but if you if you really try to to put these people into into the modes of of generating value which again leads me to another challenge which is, um, well, it's a real race for talent. It's really hard to get uh, good programmers. Uh, you know, they, they sell out like uh, uh, hot cookies. It's really difficult to get talent. And it's difficult even for universities. It's, it's difficult for anyone in the public sphere to attract talent. So um, it, it feels like there's there's so much potential but we're not so much coordinated yet on how to harvest it in a good way and i find just quite sad that we have a, a whole generation of super smart people that have their goal in life to increase the number of clicks on a certain website and and you know to have that as your goal in life yeah it pays well but but you know it, it, it i I don't want to answer. I'm just putting it out there. Um, I would like to, I, I really resonate with what you said. And I think, um, you know, this is why I started to work with scientists, Francesco, for example. Um, I think the motives behind using AI should come from awareness and consciousness. And as banal as it might sound, doing something for greater good rather than for another app and purely income and creating waste and waste and waste. And I think uh, what would be great is to, to have uh, 
laws, agencies, hubs, organizations um, that uh, I, I think we need more of those. Uh, I was participating in one of those where I was able to, with my ideas, meet all, um, like minded people that could provide me with uh, with the science. I'm coming from fashion background and I had fashion tech ideas. I never aspired to be engineer or programmer myself. I believe collaboration is only strong if you have people who all know what they're doing, not experimenting. Um, and I think it will be great to create hubs that uh, can address the problems as um, the, the main problems we are experiencing as humanity and they are quite triggering and kind of act now sort of problems like climate change uh, uh, where there can be funds from European Union or whatever other funds um, available to create the solutions that are actually needed. Not as you said, just another app for the sake of another click. Uh, so that's something I wanted to add. Um, can I add yeah. one thing about this topic? Sure. Um, Thank you. The, the area that we are working in, me and, and Joanna, that we call consciousness hacking or transformational technology, is a new field that is arising that is all about using technology hacking in programming to develop tools that will allow you to transform yourself for you to grow as a human being it's not again it's not creating an app just because it will give you money because traveling is is a thing that will give you money but it's creating an app that you can use on your phone and with sensors you can know more about your brain you can know more about how you are meditating and can lead you with the biometric data and with the ai to levels of awareness that otherwise you cannot reach without the help of this technology. Uh, I always say to my patients when they ask me what is neurofeedback, what's, why do I should use neurofeedback to meditate if I can meditate without using technology? Uh, the thing is that with AI and biometric data, you can reach quicker states that you cannot reach otherwise. And some people, they don't have the inner tools to understand the differences or the different cues that your body is giving to you. So you need technology and AI to help you reaching that different levels. This is one thing. The other thing is, is again, an ethic thing that we have to think about, that is the democratization of the technology. Uh, as Fernanda said, we are reaching a gap uh, between people that love technology, people that hate technology, but there's another gap that is people that they they can have technology because they have money and people that they cannot have technology because they don't have money. And if you are talking about transhumanism and cyber, cyberpunk movement or cyborgs, we will have a branch of people that because they have, they are, uh, they have money or they have uh, ways of um, upgrading themselves as transhumans, they, they will um, be able to reach things and levels, even brain levels or cognitive levels that people that they don't have money, they cannot. So I think it's uh, the governments and the lawmakers, they have to make sure that somehow this technology is democratized and can reach everyone or else we will have a gap even bigger between the transhuman people that they have gadgets and they are cyborgs that they can they can upgrade and enhance their abilities abilities brain abilities and the people that they they stay on the on the same level and that could be very problematic in the future um yeah so that was the two points i wanted to, to state as important so um, as you were all touching this point and that like since machines are reproducing human intelligence and forcing us to do things and taking decisions from us, I would like to ask you, Francisco, but of course to Joanna and Fernanda, of course, your point of view on what's the, the future of the human brain. So if, if our brains are going to mutate uh, with this technology, if we are somehow mutating the future of the human existence, and also what's the 
role and the future of our souls. If we really will need our brains in the future, what's the role of our souls? That's a very tricky, tricky question. <laughs> um, so first question, the future of the brain. I really believe, but that's my opinion. That's um, what I believe in. That's what I work in. I really believe that we are going to reach a transhumanistic uh, era and that everyone will somehow, we already are. Everyone has a phone. A phone is a gadget that is uh, enhancing our abilities. So if you're using a phone, we are a transhuman because we can have everything on the phone. Um, I, I went to a very uh, interesting, I went to a conference about neuro enhancement uh, ethics and there was a philosopher talking about, he was reading a script from the ancient Greece where they were criticizing the pen, saying that it was a very dangerous technology because our memories would, would, would fade forever because now we could put our thoughts in a paper. And they were talking and they, they were having debates about should, should, we, should we kill the pen or not kill the pen because it's a very it's a dangerous technology for the future. So it's, these problems come from the ancient times. In the beginning was the pen, now it's AI. So I think we will always evolve and we always have tools or outside of our bodies or inside of our bodies that will allow us to grow. So I really believe that the future of the brain is, um, is cybernetic, is somehow connected to the internet. And for that, and Elon Musk is doing that with with Neuralink and with that we need some type of hardware or technology as a sensor to connect our inner net to the outer net. Uh, so that's how I see uh, the future of the brain. Um, the other question was if, can you, can you remember me? If, Second if, one? if we are mutating our brains, so if, if these technologies applying to our brains are somehow mutating the human existence. Uh, uh, and by mutating, course, you say like, like what, replacing the brain or? Yes, replacing or at least like adding new functions or killing functions that we already use and have um, in the future, we will not need it because there is there are machines thinking from us um yeah so in the beginning we all we will always need a brain at least to create a machine so that's the first that's the first point uh secondly we have to divide the brain by its different functions so we have cognitive functions we have emotional functions and then we have the sense of self and then we have moral or morality and ethics i know that nowadays ai are able to do almost every cognitive task that the brain can do even better um, maths decision making memory that's already uh, done very well by ai emotional um, categorization or em emotional decision making and my team we work a lot on that we have an algorithm that is called emotional engagement that we can uh, track the physiology of emotion and understand if someone is liking or not liking a stimulus. And uh, for instance, if you go to buy something in a store, you can have a sensor that says to you if you like or not physiologically that, that product. And then other questions arise because one thing is your physiology of, a, of the engagement that you have with the product. Other thing is the concepts that you have on top of that physiologic reaction. For instance, we, we, uh, we always say the Coca-Cola and Pepsi challenge. Pepsi has a lot of sugar, so physiologically your brain will like more Pepsi. But if you go to a focus group, most of the people say consciously that they like more Coca-Cola because they are fed with Coca-Cola commercials and so on. So even here we have a decalage between your physiological emotional response and then your conscious a subjective response to a a certain emotion um, and then you have the moral brain and the sense of self but i i believe that ai is not yet there so and, and we talk about the the singularity that is when the ai will become self-aware and for that 
and then with this topic we can get to the soul so because when the soul because it's very tricky to talk about this in the scientific community but before the soul you have self-awareness and i don't believe that ai will become self-aware that's that's in my opinion because you need a lot of inner processes inner consciousness and there's a there's an author that says that an ai will never become self-aware because it doesn't have a body and people say i don't need a body because we have a computer and ai works without the body but more than 50 percent of our awareness of the world comes from the body somatic feelings and we live from that and people tend to forget that um but it's very important and an ai for now doesn't have a body of course you have sophia and um they try to create uh, a body but it's just that body doesn't have senses it's not feeling and feeding the ai and the, and the consciousness of that robot with sensory information um so that's about self-awareness and then there's the more morality uh, what is morality? What is ethics? Of course, Antonio Damasio, with, um, with the, the case of Phineas Gage, that proved that there's an the area of the brain where morality resides, and they had, they had an accident. We had like a, an accident in the head, and we damaged that area, and Phineas Gage stopped being moral. Um, but we don't understand nothing yet about morality to create an AI that can be right or wrong. Uh, and then we can be, becomes the, the bias. Who defines what is right or wrong? Is the programmer? Is a politician? Is a country? So it's very complicated to achieve these last steps of consciousness, that is morality and self-awareness. Um, that's why I don't I don't believe that AI will replace replace the brain. We will always need our brains to to somehow control or regulate the AI. Um, I would like to add something you mentioned. Yes, we have, sorry, Joanna, we, we have two minutes left. Okay, oh. very quickly. Uh, you mentioned Neuralink by Elon Musk, which requires, uh, yes, it can give you, connect you to an eye and give, for example, paralyzed people motor functions again, but it requires installing chip in the brain. I believe any chip can be hacked. So this is where wearables come handy. Uh, to have that last barrier, decision-making, if you want to use it and have it or not. Thank you. Okay, so we are reaching the end of this conversation. It was a pleasure and an honor for me to talk about such an important topic with such like-minded people. Thank you so much for being with us. For all of you who have been watching us, thank you so much. I hope you are enjoying this year's Ars Electronica Festival. Feel free and more than welcome to visit our Porto Garden and feel free to reach out each one of us if you want to proceed with this conversation. Thank you, Joana. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Fernanda, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.